Uh, yes, so uh, our first speaker is uh, Murray Elder from the University of Technology, Sydney, and he is going to tell us something about uh, when a, a Kelly graph is geodetic. Murray, please. Thanks very much, Ilya and Vladimir. And uh, thanks everyone for joining my talk. It's an honor to be the first speaker purely based on my time zone. So thanks everyone. Um, this is joint work with a cast of thousands of um, great young mathematicians. Well, not, not all so young. And just kidding. And there's two papers I'm gonna be talking about with subsets of these authors. Okay, so first of all, the word geodetic may not be familiar. So a connected graph is geodetic if every pair of vertices is joined by a unique geodesic. So what's an example? A tree. So every pair of vertices joined by a unique geodesic. So it's a generalization of a tree. Um, another example would be the complete graph. All right, I won't draw too many pictures. I'll be here all day. And another example would be an odd cycle, but not an even cycle. Um, the Peterson graph, the Hoffman Singleton graph, which you can look it up if you don't know what that one is. It has a huge number of vertices. Um, and then a recent, um, I had a, a summer student try and enumerate all of them as far as we could without breaking the supercomputer at my university. And recently, Armin and Florian Stober um, have found all geodetic graphs. Um, up to size 25 vertices with an exhaustive search and found some new ones that we didn't, we didn't know existed before. Um, and then number six is a graph whose two connected blocks um, are geodetic themselves, which what really that means is that you can take a geodetic graph that you know already, join it by a vertex to another geodetic graph. And that will still be geodetic because the only way to get from here to here is through this single vertex. Okay, so there are some examples. Um, and or who's in tiny writing on the bottom of my screen, I have references. Um, in 1962, asked um, for a classification of all geodetic graphs. And so <laughs> the best we can do so far is this. And then various classes with, uh, say, the diameter being very small, et cetera. So that's geodetic graph, an undirected Cayley graph. So I'm, I'm talking about undirected graphs here. So is um, vertices is elements, and you put an edge undirected between any two vertices if they're connected by some generator, one way or the other. Question, which finitely generated groups have geodetic Cayley graphs? Well, I think let's go through the list again. A tree, we're going to get all three groups with particular choice of generating set, of course. So you have to be careful about how you choose the generating set. So we're going to have a tree is going to correspond to three groups. We're going to have a, why that's not working. Um, Every finite group, you can take the whole generating set. Uh, no need to have the identity. That's just a bit of a waste of time to put a loop everywhere. Um, so every finite group is geodetic, but with this not particularly interesting generating set. So we've got free groups and finite groups so far. We've got odd cycles that are going to correspond to just the cyclic group of odd order. And what else? Hmm, what else can we do on my list? Well, none of those other funky examples are Cayley graphs. Peterson graph, I think that's an exercise people sometimes do. This idea of joining existing geodetic graphs along vertices, just gluing together by vertices. Um, the way that we can see that in groups is that we can take a free product of groups that we already knew were geodetic. And so far, the only ones I know are finite groups and free groups. 
So we could get the free product of finite groups and free groups. And some people call this the class of plane groups, not the most exciting class of group um, name, but I think it's kind of a cool class. So it's a sub subclass of um, virtually free. All right, so there's two directions we could go with this question. Um, what does this have to do with complexity? I don't know if I quite fit into the mold, but I think it's a super interesting question. So I wanted to, to um, present it. But here's a slight nod to complexity that if you had a finite group that was geodetic with respect to a nice, you know, not the whole generating set, it's a bit useless, um, then we'd have very fast ways to compute because we ha would have a rewriting system to get things down to um, to a normal form that, that would be a unique geodesic. So maybe it's it, it would be good to have such a thing. However, um, I'm going to be bold and make a conjecture that actually I don't know any other groups. So that's conjecture due to basically me and uh, Florian, Armin, and Adam. <laughs> and I'll explain why I think it's a conjecture, not just a, a bold claim. Maybe there's no difference. So if we switch to the infinite group, or you know, all groups, all finitely generated groups, this goes back to a paper of Shapiro in 97, um, Mike Shapiro, that Shapiro asked the question rather than a conjecture that is it true that the only possible geodetic Cayley graphs are coming from plane groups with the right generating set? So the finite parts have the full um, the full generating set as Cayley graph, or maybe just odd cycles. So that goes back to to Shapiro, and there was really no progress much on this um, between then and now. Um, if I just tell you I'm thinking of a finitely generated graph that's Cayley graph that's um, geodetic, we don't we don't even know until the work I'm going to present now whether the group is finitely presented. Um, it could be some nasty example that you could construct that somehow always had had um, unique geodesics. So, part one of my talk is infinite and then part two will be finite and I'll try to spread my time so I don't. So here's our, um, a bit of warm up and then um, I'll tell you our results. So first of all, we're gonna go a bit further than just Cayley graphs and talk about quasi transitive graphs. It's kind of a nice definition. So a vertex transitive, if there's exactly one orbit under the automorphism group. So Cayley graphs are vertex transitive. Quasi-transitive, this is an example of quasi-transitive. So that vertex is in the orbit with that one, I guess, um, but not those vertices or those vertices. So this one has a finite number of orbits. So it's quasi-transitive. This one, oh, here, that's a bit useless having in a, in a, if we're interested in geodetic, there's no point having that loop, but the loop's getting larger and larger there's going to be infinitely many different orbits there. So this is not quasi-transitive. Okay, so here are the results, which is um, myself, Giles, Adam, Davide, and Kane Townsend, my postdoc at UTS. Um, and this is the first, the big result that we prove about graph theory is that if you're quasi-transitive geodetic graph, then you have to be quasi-isometric to a tree. So that in terms of group theory, push, pushes it right down to being virtually free. So as I said before this, with Shapiro's question, we didn't even know whether you had to geodetic implied finitely presented or anything. So now we've proved that you uh, have to be hyperbolic. And then it was known by actually a result of volcker dikert that if you were hyperbolic and geodetic, then you had to be virtually free. It's a kind of an old one. We have this furthermore, just a few little extra results that we observed um, to, to argue that while well, we're strictly down inside virtually free groups, and we really hope, or we, the conjecture is that you have to be these plane groups, the free products of finite and 
three groups. So we, we hope we're down there and we're, we're sort of edging towards that with, it, with these things. So the third result in this paper is um, a re-expression in terms of finite convergent length reducing rewriting systems. But I won't talk too much about that. Um, okay. So what I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, so I won't be able to give much detail about this, but this paper's on the archive, um, is the first result and the other two basically follow in a page. So it's all about graph theory. Um, so here's a few definitions. A circuit, just to, so everyone's on the same page, is just a path with the same initial and final. The circuit is embedded if all the vertices are distinct, except the first and last. And then you're isometrically embedded, i.e. C, if the shortest distance from one vertex to another vertex on the cycle is actually to go around the cycle. Or there could be another path in a non-geodetic graph. Um, the, this could be the same length as that. But in a geodetic graph, being isometrically embedded would mean you have to travel around the cycle. So isometrically embedded circuit is something that we're interested in. And so here's a lemma that we found in a couple of different places. Andrew Everly Price is a um, was a master's student at Melbourne University when he did this work with Lawrence Reeves. If you have two geodesics starting at the same point and ending an edge apart, then alpha and beta plus this edge x form an IEC in a, ge so in a geodetic graph. When you ever have this picture, it's actually this picture. So this is one of our really powerful key results. It's a little bit non-trivial to prove it. Okay, so the thing that we do is we don't know that anything about our Cayley graph. We just know that it's geodetic, but we want to prove that it's hyperbolic. So we say, wouldn't it be nice if it was hyperbolic? Well, if it were, then we could talk about the Gromov boundary. But we can't because it's, we don't know that it's hyperbolic. So we try and define an analog of the Gromov boundary for any graph. We say that two infinite rays with with any old base points, A and B, um, are equivalent to each other if they join up and then they travel together forever after that. And we define the geodetic, geodesic boundary to be the set of all equivalence classes of geodesic rays. So one thing we know in a geodetic graph is as soon as they join up, they can't go away and then come together again. As soon as they, because that would be two geodesics of the same length. So we can define this boundary, but maybe it's not so useful. Um, a little exercise is that if you have something in the boundary and you have some favorite base point that you want, then you can find another, you can find a unique representative in the boundary that starts at that base point. Um, that notation means that starts at O instead of wherever size started. So we define a topology on this boundary. Um, we have these open sets so that um, the neighborhood of a ray is the set of all things that coincide for some initial segment. And so that this ray is further away than that ray from, from that ray. So we, we define a topology. We're completely just following the Gromov boundary idea. So one thing we can prove, there are many different ways to prove this we subsequently discovered, um, is that when we set up these definitions for any fixed space point, the topological space is Hausdorff. And this is a, a, a really important one, which definitely needs geodetic, it, that gamma is geodetic. If you're geodetic, even though we don't know this is the Gromov boundary, but just what I've defined so far, if it's geodetic, then you can change the base point and the set of all rays actually stays the same set of rays and they're, they're homeomorphic. 
So these two facts are going to lead us to something that's quite interesting. So let me go fairly quickly through the rest because I won't have any time for finite. Um, um, yeah, so the following, we got inspiration from a paper of myself and Adam. Um, if you're a geodetic graph with bounded size isometrically embedded circuits, then there's a bound on the side of what we call non-degenerate geodesic triangles. So we're not interested in a geodesic triangle that has little sticks on it. So if you have bounded IECs, then you have bounded non-degenerate geodesic triangles. And then pretty quickly from non-degenerate geodesic triangle, we can see that it's hyperbolic. And we also get that you're causing isometry to a tree with a tiny bit more work. So the, the game is to prove bounded IECs. Um, that's the goal. And so the final piece of the puzzle is what we call lollipops. And so a lollipop is an IEC with a ray glued onto it, but it's not just stuck on. It's such that this is a geodesic ray and this is a geodesic ray. So it's basically they both, it's a little bit technical. And the size of the lollipop is the size of this IEC. So what we prove is that there's a bound on the size of lollipops and then we prove that if there's bounded lollipops, then the IECs have to be bounded as well. So that's how the, the proof goes. So let me just, in one minute, give you the picture of how we prove bounded lollipops using all this topology that we've set up. So if you're a quasi-transitive geodetic graph, then there's an upper bound on the size of lollipops. Suppose there's no bound so that I can draw a whole bunch of them. Now it's quasi-transitive. So this edge here, which is what we call the top, the opposite side, I could take another bigger one and I could just stick it on by translating it with the, with the quasi-transitive. I know by pigeonhole principle, there's going to be enough um, lollipops out there that will actually match those two vertices. And then I can find another one and then I can find another one and I can glue all these lollipops on top of each other. So I think there's a better picture coming up than what I have. Um, yes, suppose there's a vertex and then another vertex and by pigeonhole principle, you're going to have infinitely many lollipops based at those two vertices. And so we get this picture. We can put all these lollipops together in this arrangement. And then what we're going to end up with is a geodesic ray that starts here. That's in our boundary. Here's another one, which is right next to it in the boundary because it shares a long prefix. And then there'll be another one which shares a longer prefix. So we're getting get a sequence of geodesic rays and they're all going to converge to this one. I'm in a Hausdorff topological space and I've got a sequence of points converging over here. If I change the base point, which we proved is a homeomorphism, if I change the base point to this one, hmm, okay, that will be the geodesic ray. That will be the geodesic, oh no, not that one. And then that one. They're all going to be converging over to a completely different point in the boundary. And so that's our proof. Of course, it's better than this crazy picture in our paper, I promise. And that's it. So we get a contradiction. There's the big proof there. So purely with this graph theory and mimicking the Gromov topology. So actually, in the end, we prove that it is the triangles are bounded. And so we prove that it is hyperbolic. And so this thing actually was the Gromov boundary after all at the end. Okay. So that's infinite. And in a couple of minutes, I'll talk about finite. And I assume we have a five minute question changeover. So um, 
let me go back to this conjecture that I was claiming that, so I might say, that, okay, I'm done with the infinite case because there are all these virtually free things that are all quasi-asymmetric to a tree. We still don't know about the plane. Plane, I would really like to know what's happening with the finite pieces anyway from the, the infinite perspective. So our conjecture for finite groups is actually the, the two examples that I gave you is the only things that we can think of. So is that a very good basis for a conjecture? So our approach was to do a computer search to run through every finite group with every possible generating set. So that's quite a large number of things up to a given size. What's the footnote? It's disappeared. Um, using GAP and using the small groups library in GAP. So um, Bettina Ike and, and a few other people in year 2000, they wanted to compute all groups up to 2000 size. So um, we got up to size 512. And we were able to look at every generating set because of these two theorems. Um, the first one is bound on the size of the generating set, that if you've got a, a group of the generating set that's geodetic, then the size of the generating set is less than or equal to five quarters the square root of, of the size of the group. Without that, we would never be able to enumerate all possible groups very well. The other one which knocks out a huge number of examples is that if you're in a geodetic calligraph, then the center, if it's even order, then you're going to immediately have to have every possible group element in the Cayley graph, in the generating set. So these two, this is pretty elementary group theory. It's quite nice. I won't have time to go through it. And this one is just some graph theory and having a spanning tree in the graph. And after, after you have too many generators in your generating set, you end up having to have every possible generator. Essentially, the key to these proofs is that as soon as you have two, four things like that, that can't be a geodesic. That, that can't live in a geodetic graph. So having an A, B like that, you have to have an edge like that, and you have to have an edge like that. And so you end up filling out the whole Cayley graph. So given those two things, this will be my last slide. Don't worry about that. Um, Oh no, that's not our last slide. This one is progress so far. So this is Florian, Armin, Adam and me, mainly Florian and Armin doing all the hard work. Um, if you're a non-cyclic group, blah, 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 the only graph is the complete graph. So we checked every possible generating set up to size 512 group, a couple of other sporadic not spread, just a couple of simple groups that we tried. If the center is even order, doesn't have how big, your potent things, some direct products, some other direct products. So basically just a enumeration thing. So it's not a complete answer, but that's our evidence of why we think there's nothing else because we didn't find anything. So I will pause there. Thanks everyone for your attention. Thank you, Murray. Thank you. Too many slides. All right. Uh, are there any questions for the speaker? So if you have questions now, you're welcome to unmute yourself uh, and ask them. Maybe I have a question. Uh, um, do you hear me? Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. We, okay. Uh, so, um, uh, Mary, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. And um, I wonder, what, what do you think of uh, the small generating sets? So, uh, were you actually trying to consider only, uh, say, two generated or three generated uh, groups? Uh, well, um, I don't know whether you believe that you may find uh, counterexamples this way, uh, or you, you believe that, uh, well, one needs to consider all generating sets. To, to find a counterexample. Possibly we could, you know, if you only had two generators, maybe we could um, 
prove a big statement and add that to the list. But this is a brute force um, search. And so we had to look for every generating set. Um, we have this, this theorem that says we can stop looking when we get up to that size, but it, theoretically, potentially, there could be something of size square root n square root of the, the group. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you. And um, actually, my question was motivated uh, by the work of uh, a student uh, that uh, I was supervising, and he was uh, trying to look at the two generated. Maybe uh, I don't remember actually the number. I can look it up. Um, so he was considering the symmetric groups and the size. I think up to seven or maybe up to ten. So S ten was the maximal one, and then he was trying to consider the uh, small generating sets, then you don't have that many at least, and you you, you may try to to find uh -huh. it this way, but uh, well, we didn't find a counter example. Uh, well, yeah, that that was the motivation for the question. Oh, thank you. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'd be happy to add it to the list. All right. Uh, are there any other questions? So uh, I actually had a question. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, Paul Shoup had this graduate student somewhere, I think in the 80s, uh, what was his name? Harry Smith or something like this? Uh, uh, and who yes. Was and there was a related result. I'm trying to remember what it was. It was something about, uh, 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 yes, I mean, the assumption was different, but the conclusion was yeah. that the group is plain. And the assumption was something like uh, through every vertex in the graph, uh, there are only finitely many embedded circuits, was it? Yeah, that's correct. That's also where we're getting the IEC result from. Uh -huh. But Haring, yeah, so that's correct. So Haring Smith proved, yeah, that um, you're you're going to be playing. Yeah, there's more to it than just what we've got here. The so bounded IEC. You're playing if uh, through every vertex there is uh, that there are only finitely many or uniformly finitely. What was it is yeah. it's. Yeah, finitely many IECs through every vertex. Yeah, through every vertex. So you haven't tried uh, verifying that kind of conditions. Uh, condition once you know that uh, your, your first result, uh, you know that the group is hyperbolic and uh, yeah, that's yeah. definitely well spotted, um, Ilya. That that's definitely where we're where we're trying. I see. Okay. That result to to push it down. We're also just looking at um, the amalgamated free products over some small finite groups that. That's the counter examples that could could exist. Haring Smith's other result is that your plane, if and only if you have a what's called a simple reduced word problem, which is a sim is a simple is a context free language with uh, only only one symbol or something. I forget exactly what it is. And reduced word problem is a set of all. Words equal to the identity that don't have any prefix that's equal to the identity. Uh, there's some connections there as well. Okay, very good. Yeah, thanks. All right. Okay. All right. Let us thank Mary again. Thank you. Okay.